Greetings, friends. My name is Steve Kelsey. And I'm Ron Leota, and this is The Roles We Play, the show about the roles we play in the games we love. On today's show, we are talking about nostalgia goggles, the age of bringing it back. Without further ado, let's start the show. All right, so uh, I, I brought this one up because, uh, well, first off, how's it going, man? Sheltering from home? This is a different format. I'm not used yeah. to not having you on the couch. I mean, I do like gazing into your wonderful eyes. Um, uh, uh, I do like that. Uh, but yeah, I don't actually. This is much more work on my part than this normally is. Uh, I, of course, <laughs> am notorious for loving the roles we play the most of all of the content that's provided that you are grateful enough to share with Dying of Exposure because uh, it literally takes me. I put in two images and a fade effect in and out on them. <laughs> and then that is that and, and then take a video file that I do not edit in any way, shape, or form and put it on the internet. Um so it is absolutely the fastest uh, uh thing. But it's going well. Um uh uh you know, we're just we're just following isolation and social distancing guidelines for another uh another little while here. I imagine maybe we'll get to, we'll probably have to do this for uh, May and potentially the June episodes because we'll have to record those in May. And then maybe yeah, toward the yeah. end of June, we'll be able to uh, be in full body condoms sitting next to each other. Hell um, yeah. Masks yeah, yeah. and uh, and I got a, I actually have a World War II era gas mask I can wear. Um, it's, well, uh, you won't hear me, hear me, but hey. Yeah, I was, be well, the, uh, I wasn't talking. I'm sure we'll be allowed to just be in the same room together. I'm oh, just okay. saying Fair it enough. gives us the opportunity to wear the full body con condoms, um, which is which is really a dream. I've been hoping. I've been wanting to broach you uh, with the subject, Ron, of potential full body condom. You know, it's uh, that's what we can call a stretch goal. That's, that's, a, <laughs> it's, ooh, that's bad. That's oh, real bad comedy. Oh, that is oh, super oh, bad comedy. Oh, this is what happens when we don't get to see people. Um, we get worse at being funny. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, what's what's today's episode about? We're we're talking nostalgia goggles. I've realized, uh, uh, uh like with this whole Final Fantasy VII remake, uh, being the talk of the town and. Uh, all these new games recently uh, bringing it back. I wanted to go a little bit into like, you know, we saw this like rise of like HD remasters for the longest time. And then now we're seeing like full on remakes slash reimaginings of games like, like I said, Final Fantasy 7, Resident Evil 2, and now 3. And they're talking about doing 4, which we can get into how bad of an idea that is. Um, yeah. S System Shocks being remade, which, ooh, that's a... That's going to be a touchy one. You got to do good on that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, so what aspects of remake? Because I feel like you gave me notes for both episodes and they're similar. And because uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we record these back to back. And now I can't remember yeah, so, specifically um, uh, so about the, uh, the remake for this for one. What are, we, episode, what are we, we doing talking with the about, like, gog goggles for this one? Yeah. So like uh, 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 we're going to be doing uh, for this one, we're going to be talking more about like um, remakes and uh, kind of their role in gaming. And then the next one, we're going to be talking about like spiritual successors and oh, carrying yeah. that torch on when there's like, you know, no one's willing to do it anymore. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. That makes that makes my notes make more sense now. All right. So, because um, of course I didn't separate them by episode. So I was like, which one is this? Um, uh, <laughs> I just I just threw up two text documents because um, I'm super professional. Um, all right, so remake. So Final Fantasy VII remake. I can jump right into it. Have you been playing it? I have not. I don't have a PS4. I'm uh, gonna have to wait for that uh, uh, fabled PC edition in a year or so. But I know you've uh, been playing it. Yes, yes, I have been playing it. I am. I was discussing in uh, uh, my Tuesday through the mill D and D group. Um, uh, we were discussing it after the session because I am a huge Final Fantasy nerd. I've played all of the core games, the, the 1 through 10, 10 to 12, 13, the two sequels to that, 15, Tactics, uh, Chocobo Racing, like, like, uh, uh, the, the snowboarding one. I've played pretty much anything. Crystal Chronicles? Ones. Crystal Chronicles, played it, um, all of the Game Boy ones, um, uh, uh, Mystic Quest, of course. Uh, uh, you know, just uh, pretty much the entire oeuvre. And so I was extremely 
extremely concerned about Final Fantasy VII's remake. And it wasn't for the same reasons that a lot of gamers were concerned. A lot of people were upset they were breaking it up into chapters, so it was going to be a multi-game release. A lot of people were upset that they you know, were worried about little changes or how they were going to do the battle system. And my panic was that Final Fantasy VII's remake, if it was a basically an HD graphics upgrade, or basically just that plus Final Fantasy XV's battle system, whole hog, um, was going to suck because the story of Final Fantasy VII, sorry fanboys, it's not good. It's not a good story. It's a fun story, <laughs> but it is terrible. The characters are shallow. There's not enough time with anyone. The motivations seem forced. The story takes a huge juke in the third disc, which we don't get to in the first game. You're not introduced right, right. to the actual uh -huh. villain that you're fighting um, until midway through, which would be fine if it didn't really abandon Shinra at about the same time, so it felt like two separate like villain arcs. Um, uh, you don't get enough time with any character for them to be realized. You don't get enough time in Midgar. Uh, your later uh, companions of Vincent, who's optional, Yuffie, who's optional, and Kate Sith, who I think is for some reason required, um, are all pretty much nonsense and pale <laughs> in comparison to Sid. So, like, it's, it's, it's absolutely, like, my third or fourth favorite Final Fantasy game. I love Final Fantasy VII, but I accept that much like the last few episodes of Neon Genesis Evangelion, it's pretty much garbage. It's hot trash all the way through, and um, and I cannot... I, I was so panicked that they weren't going to take the time to fix it, and instead, they absolutely took all of the time to fix it and make... It's still very anime, very Japanese gaming story in a lot of ways. There's still some awkward things, but uh, that don't, like, make sense to me as a Western gamer exactly. But overall, it's a great game. And uh, it's amazing. And I love it, and I'm getting my ass kicked by a boss in it right now. So uh, I suppose, like, this is a very mild spoiler alert, uh because I follow gaming news and I, I've had parts of um, Final Fantasy VII spoiled for me, um, the remake. Uh, uh, but, like, I know that there's has been some changes to it. I know some people yes. have even saying that is a spoiler, so sorry. But there have been some changes made to it and there's some changes uh, to the story arc a bit. And I know a lot of people felt super precious about that because Final Fantasy VII is a lot of people's favorite games. It's not ever a lot of people's top ten lists. Personally, oh, yeah. Final Fantasy IX, better game, hands down. I, I love Final Fantasy. That's that's probably, that's my favorite personally, and that's a weird one to love. But anyways, um, but like I know a lot of people are very precious about Seven, and I know the changes are making people a bit upset. But I, I personally think in this age of bringing it back, doing remakes, if you're gonna remake a game and not just do an HD remaster you got to do something a little bit different. you got to make it interesting and new. Um, a good example of this was how they did the Resident Evil 2 remake, which I played probably about, about two months ago. And there were beats in that game that were definitively changed to make the game scary again. And that, that I think, is brilliant. Because um, you can just keep with the old format, and you can keep with all the old content, and people would have been fine with just... This is oh, yeah. Final Fantasy with, like you said, Final Fantasy XV's combat system and a beautiful coat of paint. But yeah. it's rad when they go above and beyond, and I'm super stoked to hear that you're having that experience. Oh, it's it's a gift. I'm I'm very happy with the, like 99% of the story changes, the beat changes, um, the expansion, um, everything feels right. It feels like Square. It feels like. Uh, Square Enix swung at making Final Fantasy 7 today. That's what it is. Is It doesn't feel so much... It is a remake, and it absolutely mm. benefits by people who have those feelings, myself included, about playing it the first time. I was 16 when it came out, um, uh, and I, you know, it, it really impacted me. It was the first 3D RPG I ever played. Yeah, the in-game characters were blocky, but the background painted scenes, the constant camera angle changes, uh, the score, all of it was killing it. And then rather than do that coat of paint thing and get that nostalgia money, um, they really made a swing at it. Like, 
no, this is, if we made Final Fantasy VII today, this is the game we would make. This, it's The battle system is a little bit like 15, but a lot like Kingdom Hearts, which is a great choice um, because Kingdom Hearts is a really good battle system. Um, and just the story and all the characters and all the world is fleshed out. There's a little bit of filler, but what JRPG doesn't have it. And uh, yeah, yeah, um, uh, I love it. Um, I, I love that you brought up Resident Evil 2. Uh, because the moment you're like, well, updates to Resident Evil 2 that really improved the game, and I'm like, like making it basically like Resident Evil 4 and how it plays, um, physically, because they figured it out in 4, and they're like, oh, this is how you should control this game. I see, it took us a few, but we got there. This is optimal horror shooting. Um, uh, Wait, people don't feel like tanks when they're moving around? I don't understand that. Yeah, yeah um, uh, and, uh, yeah, it was, it, that was really fun, but yeah, I... I, it's it's one of the things, and we'll we'll move on from this because I can talk about Square Enix. Uh, one day we're gonna do an episode about Square Enix specifically, um, and all of their games <laughs> and back when they were just Square and then Square Soft and then Square Enix and the games that the other companies made that they bought. Um, but uh, one of the things I love about Square Soft and one of the things that I had hope for is that even though Square Enix as a company is still in the place very much of like dragon quest and final fantasy and like long running series um and you can ignore the things that they publish like um uh deus ex and stuff like that because those are different uh studios that make them they're not the square enix studios themselves but um um uh, but even though they have a, a history of of running sort of like a lot of long running series they have since final fantasy 10 essentially swung big on what their rpgs would look like in modern gaming that you know uh the super nintendo and the playstation era updates and graphics updates and some things you can do but essentially turn-based or active time battle uh turn-based combat and then and then in the ps2 it was like final fantasy 10 was sort of like the last moment of that and then they kept trying to change up the battle system change up the world a lot change up the game's pacing a lot it's still kind of go kill god storylines but yeah <laughs> um but they really do swing for some things and they've always pushed themselves for graphics and and um this does both of those things. So if you like Square Enix games, there's no reason to be mad at the Final Fantasy VII remake unless you are that very serious person that's like, they changed anything, and I wanted it like Grandma used to make back when I was a kid. Which I understand, it's just sad, because I would be much more upset if that's all they did, was just re-release the yeah. same game. Oh, yeah. And I mean, and, and, and it goes to show just like how polished those games were like right now. Um, I got jealous of everybody playing Final Fantasy seven remake. So I picked up uh, Final Fantasy 10 HD remaster. Um, and that game holds up a lot in a lot yeah. of ways. Um, all it is is just HD textures and it still looks gorgeous. And um, the story is still I think fun and another one of those ones that was really fun and uh, had more depth than I p think people gave it like credit for because well, I mean Titus was insufferable but <laughs> the uh, game overall is really cool and, and and like you said it does stand that test of time they really do try to push themselves graphically I would almost argue that Final Fantasy 7 remake is what they've always what they w always wanted to make Final Fantasy it's seven because you have like um, Advent Children which looks like what yeah. now they're making this into absolutely and i felt like advent children was an example of like man i wish we could do this in a video game and now they're just pretty doing much it doing it <laughs> yeah it's basically it looks like advent children through almost the entirety of the game except for the textures the textures in final fantasy 7 are garbage textures that look like the textures from final fantasy 12 which is weird because that was a oh, like a end of life cycle ps2 game but uh, that's what they look like, and it's funny because the characters and everything you interact with and the environment scenes are all great, and then you get down to what do the walls look like, and it's like the walls look like butt. The walls look like <laughs> the walls look like 480p in a 4K game. I don't understand what happened here. I don't. I guess you just ran out of effort or time, but it is what it is. So um, uh, 
another factor I kind of want to add in here with this like age of bringing it back is there's also I've seen this trend recently of like sequels being announced for games that you never thought there was actually going to do the sequel for and it's been so long that you're just like eh, I ain't ever going to get another another game but like Deadly Premonition put out their uh HD remaster for uh the Switch and immediately announced oh yeah we're finally doing Deadly Premonition 2 which as a awesome part hardcore twin peaks slash deadly premonitions fan um i am so 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 happy um vampire bloodlines uh is doing a sequel yeah Um, it is and uh psychonauts 2 is supposedly going to be made this year i mean i'll believe it when i see it but again it's it's another one of those it seems in these i don't know maybe it's just the time we're living in where everything's very tumultuous that we're all like Hey, that thing I loved 20 years ago is super freaking comforting. Um, I think that's you're, you're you're just saying basically that you're like now this is happening as opposed to then kind of thing. Um, uh and I think that's part of it. I think another big part of it is that if you think of gaming, video gaming specifically as a cultural thing. Um, you're really looking at a larger mass of culture every several years growing into it and uh, more and more of culture adopting it. So for people like yourself and myself that think of gaming as something that we did as first linear memory children all the way through versus uh, the wider culture, which might not have adopted it until around the PS2 original Xbox era, which is when it really exploded and started uh, shooting up in numbers. Um, uh, you're looking at things that these sort of nostalgia things can now hit a large audience. Uh, also, game developers have more access to sales numbers and information, and it's easier to codify what happens with re-releases and uh, deep sequels because uh, because of Steam and the modern digital age, which because retailers were always would always just give game developers how many copies they were sent, like they'd put in their orders for it, and then that's as much as publishers knew for sales. They just knew that they gave Target and Best Buy and GameStop this many copies and then that's as far as the publisher is concerned that's how many copies are sold because they got paid for those copies um and so now that there's a digital idea they can see that it's like all right so like this many people have played it or bought it on steam and and we're getting these kind of xbox live numbers and we can infer this from gog and and stuff like that and so if we put those together we can estimate that if we release a sequel and about two-thirds of the people that like to play through the game pick up the sequel will make this amount of money so now they can do that they can plan for that whereas before it's like well physical copy wise this only sold so much and so it's kind right, of right. a gambit to run a, ga- a gamble to run it um but i also think that it's just that broader audience uh, uh that came in now has nostalgia we you know those that have been playing game video games for over 30 years have had this nostalgia and have been playing these re-releases on game boy advance and ds and playstation 2 and playstation 3 and play japan loves to re-release their games and then make deeper sequels to games but um but those that kind of got into it in the ps2 era that's still only about 20 years ago so if they played a game in 2005 there wasn't time for it to be a deep sequel until the last few years because it had only been around for 10, 12 years or, you know, like it needed to be around for long enough for it to be that. So I think that's what we're hitting is we're finally hitting the phase where it's like, all right, people get excited about a game that they played that finally gets that sequel um, or finally gets that re-release remake. Um, But they need, they need a decade and a half to get, yeah, and, and it's really weird because, like, you you brought up our age, and I think that's actually a big component of it. Um, I mean, we are kind of a nostalgia generation, and it kind of blows my mind seeing really young reviewers on YouTube talking about Final Fantasy VII as this brand new experience, or hearing people getting upset because, you know, what we would consider an incredibly iconic moment in gaming is spoiled for them because of a death of a character is given away or something. And that's yeah, brand know, new right? information. And, and to me, I'm like, I've been making dumb 
death jokes about that character since I was a kid when this came out. And I'm realizing more and more is it's like, yeah, but I was a kid a really long time ago at this point. Like I'm actually getting yeah. old and it's, and it like, I was like, yeah, I was checking out. When did, uh, when did final fantasy 10 come out? Oh, like 17 years ago. Yeah. That's, that's wow. Okay. I remember, I remember getting together with my roommate at the time. And uh, he and I had grown up together. We'd been the grade school, high school kids that then moved into uh, grade school, high school friends that moved into each, in with each other um, uh, uh, to go to college. And uh, he and I sat down, got, got Final Fantasy X on opening day. We're working shitty teenager jobs or shitty, you know, like late teens, early 20s jobs. We both decide to sacrifice some meal options so that we can take a few days off together and we boot up Final Fantasy X and it's like the opening scene in the Blitzball sphere in the future, um, uh, 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 <laughs> if you will. Just our faces were melting at how goddamn beautiful it was. And we were like, we were like, this is so worth it. And to think that that, is the same that 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 people who are almost legal to drink and definitely legal to vote now were born that year um or were like one or two years old that year that year when i was no longer living with my parents i was no lo i was working full time i was going to school i had my car I was paying my bills it blows my mind so like to to them final fantasy 10 i i again a tangent when i was talking about final fantasy and and being into it uh, there are a lot of younger people that are into it but i feel like people over a certain age and i would say definitely in their 30s and older um and maybe a little older than that um it, like maybe maybe closer to 35 have like this deep nostalgic love for final fantasy because we got to come to it when it was fucking hot shit when it was Final Fantasy 4 and 6 oh, yeah. on the Super Nintendo, when it was 7, 8, 9 on the PlayStation and a 10 on the PS2. So our childhood was filled with, yeah, you could criticize these games, but they're all goddamn amazing versus a person who maybe turned 8 in 2000, you know, maybe turned 8 in 2005. And so their Final Fantasies have been 12 uh 13 13 2 and 13 3 15 and 2 MMOs and so for them the main final fantasy series is like these have all been much more complicated difficult to like games because they're no longer on their hot streak because the president left the studio and they sort of forgot what they were about for a while and because the studio itself demands to innovate so for them their Final Fantasy is like Kingdom Hearts, where it's like, it's fucking Kingdom Hearts is great, and even though it's a nonsense plot and everything, people were super amped for Kingdom Hearts 3, which is absolutely a deep sequel of nostalgia that that, that Square took advantage of as well, just last <laughs> yeah, year absolutely. instead of this year. I didn't even think about that. I didn't even note that. I was like, oh yeah, Kingdom Hearts 3 was like, what, like a decade after Kingdom Hearts 2 or something like that? More than a oh, decade? Yeah. It's crazy. But uh, yeah, um, uh, what other what what are some other games that have had some like super deep? I mean, Duke Nukem Forever is the classic failure, but um, <laughs> yeah, let's talk oh, about no. that. Let's talk about that. Let's sit. Let's let's put our minds to it. What are some games that you can think of that were deep sequels that ended up being like you you wanted to play on that nostalgia factor for a great series, and then you essentially shit the bed. Okay, so we've already Duke Nukem obviously just right out of the gate. Um that was just a that was just bad. It was it was the original game wasn't that great, but I mean it was it was an important game in design wise and it was the right kind of edgy for its time, but oh man did they yeah, never mind. They but um so another one that that comes to mind and I'm not sure if it 100% counts, but it feels like they took a pretty long break with Darksiders. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And then came back with Darksiders 3 and it was kind of hot doo doo. Like Yeah. Well, that has a lot to do. That was that was not anyone's fault. That was a business problem. 
THQ shut down and went out of business, and they were the ones who were publishing Dark Darksiders. And then, like three years later, they had a big deep sale of all their properties, and THQ Nordic, which is owned by a former president of THQ, but not the THQ Corporation that ran THQ. Uh, so THQ Nordic bought it and then took four more years to develop it. So it was a it was a whole ground up different team that made Dark Siders three, but it was a, a, a misfire. Because the game was garbage, and so it didn't matter that people loved one and two. They were like, they were like, eh, eh. See, eh. and what and what I'll bring up that uh, is to me un unprecedentedly bad is that like, okay, so you always say that thing where it's like, yeah, you can hate the new thing, but it doesn't ruin the old thing for you. You know, like yeah. I can say I don't like the Star Wars prequels, but that's not going to stop keep me from loving four, five, and six. Yep, but. Then you have something so unprecedented like the uh, re-release of uh, Warcraft 3, where they literally ruined the original game. No, no, I don't, I don't even want you to continue talking about this. You're hurting my feelings by reminding me. I forgot. I had pushed Warcraft 3's re-release out of my mind. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry for bringing it back up. But it's true. For people it's listening, so for people listening that don't know it. Go go forward. So, uh, my understanding of the whole situation. So they uh, they first put out these videos showing this very polished, very good looking game. Uh, then the game in no way matches uh, what they promoted it looking as. It was a very shoddy remake. The texturing wasn't that great. The uh, they didn't end up redoing the uh, in game videos like they said they would, and. It also, since they were using their original server stuff, it basically blocked you off from being able to play the original game and you were forced pretty much to, now here's the new hot mess, enjoy it. Uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a dark time, but it was, again, another episode. We could just do a hate on episode about Blizzard. <laughs> um, <laughs> ooh, ooh, that company. For a person that's played Diablo three like a like a half dozen times, Diablo two more times than I can count, uh, and uh, and and Overwatch for like two years straight, um, uh, I sure do hate that company. Um, I sure hate them. Um, I even think Hearthstone's a good card game, and I still hate that company. I hate them to death. But I've also played EA games, and I hate EA too. So you know, publishers are are, are gonna publish. Uh, game studios are gonna fuck around. Um, uh, no, another other deep cuts that didn't really work. Um, uh, that that had gone like a long time without a sequel. Uh, they did. Um, uh, 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 they did two Pitfall games, and one was really good, and one was real trash. Um, real hot trash, and that was one of the deepest cuts. I have ever seen because one was like an indie side scroller that was basically the original Pitfall, and that one was good. And then, and then one was like, "We're gonna update Pitfall. Remember Pitfall? Forty something year olds and above." And, and they released it, and it was again. It was like, "Who's don't? No one's looking for Cubert X, the new Cubert game. Like you can't go that far back and release something based off of." what was essentially a mechanic that became a game. Like, they're, you know, the Atari era wasn't like full-fledged games. They were like, here's a mechanic you haven't seen. You have to time your swing over a pit. And you're like, okay, I have not seen that mechanic. You have to dodge um, different, you know, you have to twitch dodge different bullets as ships approach you. Okay, I haven't played that mechanic. You have to not hit your own tail, right? Like, those kinds of games. Hey, I will say I will say though, in defense of games that were born of a of a mechanic, Portal. Well, so yeah, but they're not re-releasing Portal, right? Like they just they. Well, made I, Portal. I know, but I'm saying it, I'm saying like it's it's one of those games that like it's it was oh. based on a mechanic, but like turned into being a brilliant story. Oh, and yeah. actually, like wonderful game. <laughs> yeah, to clarify, games based on a mechanic aren't necessarily bad games. I would argue that Doom, the remake of Doom. Um, which we can absolutely segue into, is based on the mechanic uh, of of push forward, push forward, run back, be aggressive. Like that whole 
game oh, yeah. is paced around that one mechanic. They built the like the the healing potions coming up out of it. They built like like your ability to to uh, get ammunition with the idea that's like it is good for you to go in and kill aggressively, but you need to keep moving. And they've centered, and it's why Doom 2016 and uh, Doom Eternal are such good games, is because oh, they yeah. live on that one basic combat theory and mechanic of move around quickly and kill things, um, or else you will lose, and and everything. Um, which is why when Doom came along and saved Doom as a series, um, because Doom Three was the last one and it was hot trash um and then doom 2016 came out and they're like they're like not only is this good this is like very good this is ridiculous good um so that that was a good deep sequel that i appreciated that made it feel even though it feels nothing like the original doom it feels exactly like the original doom it doesn't play exactly like it. It doesn't f pace like it, but it feels like it emotionally while you're playing it. And you're just like, I don't know how they figured this out. What kind of brilliant. I, I know that that team had had a whole nother game in mind, like a whole nother concept of how Doom, uh, Doom 2016 was going to be like, and then scrapped it midway because they're like, this is not working. And it was the best decision that team made because their game went on to sell a shit ton of copies reinvigorate a franchise and win a ton of video game awards and make people thirst for a sequel within two weeks of the game coming out everyone was like just give me more of this over and over yes. again and i will play it and so a good mechanic game is still good it's just kind of harder to find because most things have been done but it's weird that a first person shooter hadn't just been simple like yeah but what if what if you play a first person shooter for like the actual first person combat like, what if that's the most important part of a game? <laughs> is the game, the game playing part of it. What if that's the best part? And all of the graphics and story and everything are are a nice addition to how fun it is to play killing things. And I'm like, mmm, mmm. Ah, uh, I need to I still need to play Doom Eternal. I I I, I haven't had time for it because I've been too stuck on Final Fantasy VII because I only want remakes in my. I only want my childhood back. I don't want anything else anymore. Just give me my childhood back. Eternal is rad. My only uh, complaint about it is, which is so weird for me as a storyteller and somebody who loves story. It, there's almost too much talking and story in Doom Eternal because I don't. I don't play Doom to learn or expand my life or become a for. better person. I, I do it to rip and tear. And uh, uh, I want to I want to kill some guys. That's why I loved the the for the the first Doom remake. In in that moment where you're like, I am just a seething ball of testosterone and rage that literally grabs the story and casts it aside so I can kill demons more. Yeah, they 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 very gently and subtly insert pieces of a story in Doom 2016 that really works to almost like spice the game without in al at yeah. all being its main flavor and yeah i have seen online and heard from friends that are playing doom eternal they're like it's still fun and it's still very good but it lost a bit of its pacing to give you a bit more story and that is not i i think that uh, uh, most people agree it's like it's not that that's terrible it's just less good it's just slightly less good because it, it gets in the way of me ripping and tearing, which is all anyone wants to do in Doom is rip and tear. That's all they want. Um, and uh, uh, it's the right choice. Um, uh, Animal Crossing, weirdly enough, feels like a nostalgia game to me, even though they released Animal Crossings like every four or five years. Um, yeah, since that's, it a, started. that's a staple thing. <laughs> it's a staple series, but it feel I haven't looked at an Animal Crossing since the first one, so it feels <laughs> like a nostalgia game to me. My my partner is playing it, and they are full all the way they do, into it. They're a hundred percent on Animal Crossing. Uh, they're playing it right now, um, and they will be playing as, it as, until as they go my to wife. sleep. <laughs> yep, yep. That's that's she started date or, or they started uh, date. Um, uh, like changing the dates on their switch, uh, cause they got to that level of impatience cause they had enough time. They were like, 
I need to I need to get to a certain point in this game so that I have enough potential stuff coming at me to eat up the amount of time I want to play this game in a day. Um, and so, so uh, yeah, yeah. So that's but for me, it seems like a nostalgia game. Even though, yeah, they've uh, I can't remember when the last one was released, but it was within the last five years. Like they've released one every you know three to five years since it came out. Um, I think maybe you're feeling it because it's the first console mainstay for a very long time because i'm pretty sure they skipped the wii u generation um until they got to switch was the like first like okay we're gonna put this on a console again because the last one was on the ds right the last uh, ds uh, yeah th- yeah all right man well uh we're just about out of time here I had some fun talking about the old nostalgia goggles um of course if people want to check this out they can always head on over to dying of exposure on the youtube i'm calling it the youtube because i'm older it is yep mm. it is a proper noun it youtube is a proper <laughs> noun so you can call it there's not it's not like there's a lot of other youtubes like running around the internet there's a lot of other word plus tube that are usually porn but uh not not a lot of other youtubes <laughs> and if hey uh if you're watching this uh our wonderful skype call and want to check out the audio only version for whatever reason you can check us out over on the website that's gonna be uh the roles we play dot podbean.com or facebook.com slash the roles we play to join in on some conversations tell me about uh some of the cool nostalgia goggle games that uh we may have missed or ones that you think are some of the best and worst. I think that would be that'd be a fun conversation to have. I think, <laughs> coughing because of my hookah. Um, I think that uh, um, I I agree with you. I think people should listen to this in podcast form. There's no benefit to seeing my face. If you want to see my face, uh, I'm gonna plug something else. Only because this is a I'm I, only because this is a um uh, a gaming uh, podcast series. If you want to see my face, you can see me run a tabletop series called Through the Mill on either twitch.tv slash dying underscore of underscore exposure or uh, on the YouTube uh, at uh, at <laughs> Dying of Exposure. It happens every Tuesday night, 7.30 p.m. Pacific live on Twitch. And then Friday is when I migrate the episodes over. Um, we've had three episodes so far. Um in the series and it will go weekly until quarantine is done and then probably go bi-weekly after quarantine is done um because people's lives will get back to being busy but right now a bunch of people are like yes please weekly anything a tuesday night sounds great just give me something uh to do at home um and so you can go check that out that is a homebrew tabletop series uh, that I would like people to watch because I think it is good and I made up the world and I want people to enjoy the world with my players. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, of course, if you want to check out, uh, I we've talked about it a few times. I actually haven't ever plugged it, so I'm just going to give you a plug here. Um, if you're interested in checking out um, some of the stuff I do, which is mostly LARPing and role-playing, that's, uh, you can check me out on Leota Role-Playing on the Facebook. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good place to check out all the things I'm doing. I repost this stuff. I post all the tabletop stuff I'm writing, board game stuff, or LARP stuff. So there you go. All right, let's wrap this one up, and we'll see you on next time. I am Ron for Steve and uh, this lovely podcast. I'll play myself out.